Thank you, Ashwin. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Abhishek, and uh, uh, the we are going to today. Today we are going to talk about the issue of data protection, data safety. So you can call it uh, many names. So this uh, series of e dialogues is organized by All India Institute of Local Self Government, United Cities and Local Governments Asia Pacific, and also Urban Update Magazine. In this series, we are touching upon different uh, topics, different uh, issues that evolved during the pandemic. And one topic that we cannot ignore, that is of data protection, data safety, data security. Because most of our activities, whether we talk about meetings, whether we talk about our day-to-day uh, -day official uh, uh, activities, they have gone online. We are sharing a lot of data digitally. So the question of data safety has arisen and, and how the, uh, the governments world over is handling the issue of data safety. Today, we are joined by Mr. Vijay Shankar Nagraj Rao, who is also popularly known as Navi, is presently the executive chairman of Foundation of Data Protection Professionals of India. He's an information assurance consultant and has also been the founding director of Cyber Law College he has been at the forefront of netizen movement in India. He is also the author of first book on cyber crimes in India named Cyber Laws for Every Netizen in India. And his latest publication is Personal Data Protection Act of India 2020, EDPA 2020. So uh, welcome, sir, to this one-on-one uh, -on -one discussion. And I'm very, I'm, I'm very sure I can assure our audience that we are going to discuss a very important uh, aspect of data safety and security. And you, you are going to get uh, critical uh, 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 analysis of how this ecosystem works and how you can make sure that your data is safe with the companies that you are sharing with. So, sir, uh, uh, we will start with this uh, whole change in our day-to-day uh, -day activities after this pandemic hit us in uh, March 2020 this year. So most of our activities have gone online. Whether we talk about our official meetings, we talk about our seminar conferences, and like we are discussing today, this uh, uh, interview. So what has changed during this pandemic? And why we should be worried about this data safety at all? Uh, thank you, Mr. Pandey. And, uh... I'm glad to be uh, with you to discuss one of the uh, most passionate uh, topics of uh, which I have been pursuing for quite some time. Um, of course, you have asked a question whether um, after the pandemic, whether there has been uh, some big change or something like that. And uh, you are asking me who 20 years back started Cyber Law College uh, as a virtual educational institution. So what I feel is that um, the system of this virtual uh, interaction has always been available to us, but uh, perhaps the market did not find the need for it earlier because one, we always have a register we are using to meeting across the table. We always prefer to do that. And uh, uh, people like us have traveled from uh, uh, say here to all the way to Delhi for half an hour or 20 minutes uh, <laughs> uh, time in a, a conference. How much of expenditure uh, people have spent and how much of time we have devoted, uh, all that has now become uh, redundant because um, I can be with you now for another uh, half an hour, one hour, next moment I can be with somebody else. So this advantage of the virtual media has always been there. We have been deficient in not recognizing its importance. Now this pandemic in a way has forced us to think about uh, this. So what we sometimes refer to as a new normal is to my mind something which was always available. Only thing is uh, we fail to recognize its uh, potential. So uh, that way I'm quite happy with whatever has happened and a uh, large number of people have recognized its importance. People like us who have been uh, like uh, training and teaching virtually or were prepared to do so we didn't have the audience who were prepared. The audience would like us to come there uh, all the way and spend the time. And even in a place like Bangalore, if I have to go to a company uh, for one hour discussion, I have to set aside another four hours to, uh, for my travel, same way in perhaps Bombay and uh, many other places. So I feel it is a welcome change. 
So let us welcome this change of virtual interaction. At the same time, it has brought uh, the issues of uh, information security, data security um, into the fore, um, which again um, is increasing, uh, the concern is increasing basically because opportunities for criminals to exploit the situation has increased. Now, if uh, Zoom was attacked because more number of people were uh, uh, um, on Zoom, therefore somebody felt it uh, uh, ideal to, uh, let us say, hack into Zoom uh, user data or something like that. So wherever opportunities have increased, so we sometimes say cyber crimes have increased during the pandemic. The reason probably is twofold. One is that the opportunities have increased because more number of people are on the digital media now. And secondly, people who were hitherto not well versed in digital uh, usage suddenly came into it. For example, uh, my uh, older generation people went into say Amazon purchases and something like that. And they were seeing for the first time emails and SMS messages um, yeah. about various, uh, let us say, uh, awards, that kind of a thing. And uh, therefore they were vulnerable. So more work, Vulnerable people went into the digital media and the opportunities increased, except that I feel we should all welcome this uh, change and we should prepare the uh, people <coughs> to meet these challenges. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah. Very well noted that uh, this uh, change is welcome. We all welcome this change. And you have mentioned very uh, good point that audience was not prepared. The speakers were prepared, they could uh, deliver their lecture. So we, this pandemic has uh, uh, mentally prepared the audience for this kind of dialogues. My, uh, another, the, another question that uh, now with, when we talk about data, we say data is new oil and everyone wants to control uh, this data. And we have seen this discussion during these when this US elections uh, are happening now. So we were seeing that uh, there was a uh, uh, they was saying that China is controlling data or the U United States of uh, America is controlling data of users sitting in India, Indonesia, China, or anywhere else. So this question of data safety and security uh, is become very important globally also in 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 terms of uh, relation between countries. Like uh, suppose a, suppose a company is operating in India but its server is in Canada or in USA. So how these countries are managing and ensuring that the data of their citizens is safe? Can you please enlighten us on this? See, there are two aspects here. One is uh, uh, security of data, which means that data should not be uh, modified uh, unauthorizedly or uh, uh, denied access, that kind of a thing. Confidentiality is there. Second is, of course, uh, See, data ultimately it's like uh, money. Uh, unless you use it, it is no use. You cannot keep all the data uh, in your uh, silo and uh, say that I got valuable data. It is only when data is used, um, it gets value. It's like cash that way, uh, okay. So we have to find channels of appropriate usage of data rather than preventing data being used. So now we are talking of data in two major uh, types, one is the personal data and other is the non-personal data. Now, uh, almost all the countries, uh, about more than 100 uh, countries today have got personal data protection acts, okay? That is legislations. India, you know, is also working uh, on the uh, bill. We will soon join that particular uh, bandwagon of uh, countries having specific data protection laws. But of course, India already has information technology act, certain, uh, provisions. So personal data needs to be uh, accorded some additional security as compared to non-personal data. Now non-personal data has got a commercial value. That is why India is also planning to have a legislation for non-personal data governance. Okay, how to unlock the value of non-personal data. Now personal data basically needs to be protected from misuse because our bank uh, uh, accounts are linked to personal data. Uh, our health data is there, which can be misused if it falls into wrong hands. So personal data needs to be protected. So when we talk of this uh, uh, data moving across different countries, we still need to protect personal data 
in a manner in which it is not misused. Okay. Now, what is happening is uh, in the dark web or uh, in the international markets, people are acquiring this personal data for the purpose of using it against the individual. So, when we say China is having the control of uh, data, they are, uh, say, Twitter or any other social media collects a lot of data. Now, the concern is that data may be used against us on a later day. For example, you made a reference to the elections. So one fear is that any personal data may be used in such a manner that it can be used to manipulate our behavior. Okay, say capturing our behavior, profiling is yes, activity which is more scientific. We have been doing that in the advertising industry also in the past. Say no advertisement is made without analyzing the target market. So market segmentation, psychographic profiling of the target audience uh, is inherent in any business. In fact, if, if I'm talking to you, perhaps I will be talking in such a manner that uh, you will be agreeing with me kind of a thing. So it's a human tendency to try to understand the audience and try to regulate the information uh, flow. This has been in existence in advertising and other industries. What we are worried about this Cambridge Analytica or other issues is that uh, ultimately this uh, was used to benefit one of the parties. Okay. It could have been the other party, then uh, another set of people would have uh, uh, had uh, objections. So as long as it is only profiling, understanding what you are, uh, it is a, a kind of a less harmful use of personal data or behavioral analysis. But when I use it to play upon you and try to make Man. you subservient to my interest, then there is an ethical issue there. Okay, Should I leave it uh, to you to have your own independent views or I want to drag you into my political or racial uh, views? So we have to make a distinction of... Um, understanding the audience by looking at the data and trying to uh, manipulate uh, them. Of course, whether we can make this distinction or not is a question, okay? We may start by doing one thing and we end up doing, <laughs> doing the uh, other. But um, personal data has this risk of being used both for crimes as well as for profiling for further manipulation of the individuals. So people say that it uh, hurts the democratic process itself, that if you can change the views of the voter. But you tell me that uh, every election campaign, uh, voters have to be wooed by the uh, political parties. The difference is whether we are trying to woo them with uh, fact, uh, real facts, the truth, or we are uh, trying to uh, woo them with uh, fake uh, news. So the problem we have is not that of profiling, not that of advertising, on the internet, but our inability to control fake news. Okay, if we are able to control fake news, if we are able to reduce the number of fake accounts in Twitter, then we don't have to worry about positive views. See, I may support one party, you may support another party, that doesn't matter. Okay, we can still be friends. Um, and of course, if we are friends and we will be arguing sometimes that my view is correct, your view is correct, uh, and that is also fine. I don't think that is a big issue. But if I assume a particular name, a pseudonymous name, and try to say that uh, this is the view of somebody else, and that somebody else is perhaps, let us say, known to you, and uh, his views are important to you, then I am trying to manipulate you. So fake news, fake identities on social media, they are the problems which we in the privacy area are only grasping now. Okay, now, uh, see, Information Technology Act has tried to bring amendments to the Section 79, which is the Intermediary Guidelines, where we try to address the um, uh, need to, let us say, uh, track the origination of a WhatsApp uh, message and then try to introduce intermediary guidelines, uh, etc. At the same time, in the privacy law, in our Personal Data Protection Bill, we have introduced a provision that on social media, we would like people to be verified for their identity, okay, voluntarily. Of course, uh, PDPB doesn't say it should be mandatory, but it has made a proposition that verified identity should be there in the social media platforms. The platforms will have to make it 
uh, possible technically and it is left to the individual if i want to make my twitter account say vijay shankar nagraj rao uh, you have to do that okay um, i cannot use somebody else's uh, name of course uh, presently the bill doesn't prohibit it if somebody wants to use a, uh, a pseudo name it is still possible but at least more number of people would like to express their words or views in their real name i see if i am not committed to what i am saying why should i say that <clears throat> okay if i am committed i have to say that and this is the kind of this is what uh, we should encourage in democracy that is we are not trying to curb opposing views but the person who is opposing should be able to identify and say i am so and so and i am opposing view your view okay so that is the issue in this data uh, being transferred from one country to another country or being used for purposes like political campaigning and other things if we understand this many of our uh, concerns on this uh, data protection will get resolved <clears throat> sir my question another question is that that when we you, you are talking about uh, the control over data from one country transfer of data from one country to another we see we have seen this manipulation online uh, you have given sir some example like cambridge analytica and other cases where it was used to for behavioral profiling of users and uh, other things so my question is uh, i was reading somewhere that uh, we are using a lot of free services online facebook is free whatsapp is free youtube is free google is free so uh, there was a one saying that when you when you are not paying for a product then you are a product so it means that we 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 uh, the users are the product they their data is captured their profiling is done to sell them uh, products or uh, services and one more example that personal experience uh, we had we uh, one of our friends and uh, colleagues in offices were discussing about a, a particular product and uh, and of course everyone is having access to mobile phones i, I don't know it, it was a, a coincidence or it was uh, i want to know your point of view on this ki how this profiling is done and uh, 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 how this is this is sick. we we are living in a secure world we were discussing about a product and after some time when i was using my social media i was i started getting ads similar ads when of that product only so i was confused i did not type anything on my computer i did not use any keyword i was just discussing with friends with maybe my phones lying uh, near me so what kind of this profiling is and how secure reliable accountable uh, uh, this kind of profiling is hey, i am not sure whether your uh, mobile was listening to you when you were discussing of course yes. uh, we we say that there are uh, malware which can uh, do that but that might not have happened in your case but uh, if you have visited say amazon to buy some products just to explore yeah, that happens sir uh, that, yeah, that, was very, that was very startling and surprising because i did not type anything i was very sure that i did not i uh, try to remember i did not type anything and i was just having my phone with me and Uh, how are you, are you conversing with anybody uh, on the mobile about uh, your interests or products no what were, were you talk were you talking to anybody uh, no no not on the phone my okay. phone so, is like so uh, let us assume that uh, okay there is no malware in your uh, mobile you, uh, which uh, silently listens you know there, there are such malwares okay and um, people use it for spying um, against political opponents and political leaders and others and uh, sometimes if it is there in the mobile we will not be able to see it in the app uh, store okay that will be hidden and uh, even if you perhaps uh, reformat the mobile to factory settings so they may still uh, survive so there are such uh, kind of uh, malware and um, if that is there in your mobile please <laughs> try to do something okay other than that the way profiling is done is to look at uh, let us say your facebook profile or uh, something uh, of that nature uh, if you send emails uh, google will definitely look into it you see uh, in fact uh, for a long time uh, google and uh, even yahoo or uh, mail at the one point of time they used to actually scan the emails for identifying uh, let us say uh, today we are talking of hate speech at that time it was whether uh, .exe file is attached or something like that malware was only concern today we have got more concerns okay um, so they were scanning the entire email that is why 
when you open a Google email, the advertisements which come in the bottom may have relation to the content. Now, if Google doesn't know what is the content, obviously they cannot show the advertisements. So anything which is there, uh, that is easy prey. Okay, you agree with that. But you are talking of something very different, which uh, without typing or anything which is that, which uh, I don't know whether uh, you should look at uh, yesterday's uh, activities you had, maybe with that had any such uh, indications. Otherwise, it is little strange. Uh, maybe you have to check your mobile to see whether there is a uh, malware. But this kind of uh, analysis, um, say, uh, for example, today you have seen in the press that uh, one company called uh, True Indology or something like that was banned from Quora because of uh, some uh, message. The artificial intelligence uh, bots, sometimes uh, they make mistakes, okay? They don't understand the content in its uh, real, uh, you can say, uh, context, okay? Uh, if I say, let us say, Muslim doesn't mean that I am always criticizing Muslim or something like that. So artificial intelligence sometimes uh, makes mistakes. So uh, that, that's what we saw in the Quora uh, uh, case. And it can happen uh, elsewhere also. So uh, all these uh, advertising analysis, behavioral analysis is done today by AI. Uh, it is not humanly done, except that companies may have to actually have supervision, human supervision over what AI does um, before uh, uh, taking extreme decisions like banning a person or something uh, of that nature. Flagging is different. <coughs> See, flagging a content as potential uh, say whether it is uh, yeah, inappropriate content. I would like to use the word inappropriate content more than hate speech or something like that because only when you read it, you will know whether it is hate speech or not. Uh, until that time, uh, the machine can only say it's like a potential inappropriate content. That can be flagged. There is no difficulty in just flagging a particular this thing, but taking it out, banning is something which is an extreme step, which uh, is media, social media is trying to adopt, um, which is, uh, I think, uh, uh, not understanding the security environment uh, properly and misapplying the security uh, features. Okay. So, so these, uh, these are the, 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 the points that you have mentioned, that uh, profiling and then uh, this inappropriate flagging of uh, messages that we are sending online. So my uh, question to you is that now uh, India is trying to build 100 smart cities. And then when we talk about smart cities, we are not just referring to improving basic civic services. We are also trying to, uh, uh, to embed digital technology, whether we talk about uh, smart cameras where your vehicle number plate is uh, recognized and, and can be tracked or the facial recognition systems so when we are into entering into that kind of ecosystem in cities and the data is stored with the smart city offices, those are not uh, uh, well-trained and equipped to deal with data. So how, how do you see this challenge for the municipalities which, have, which don't have that kind of uh, technical capacity to handle data, to sec secure the data and should users be concerned? Say users should be concerned because the people who are collecting the data are not uh, having appropriate security measures to ensure that it doesn't leak out or something like that. Okay. See, cameras will uh, simply capture the image. Okay. The interpretation of what the camera has captured happens in the back end. Okay. So uh, what the camera captures is uh, a de-identified information in a way or anonymous information, but the anonymous information gets, uh, let's say, identified because the person sitting behind the camera can identify, oh, this person is so and so, that person is Amitabh Bachchan. He can, he can identify. So this identification happens because of the human intelligence which peruses the uh, data, unless you have made an artificial intelligence robot which uh, actually does face recognition and then tries to link it. Uh, smart cities, unless it is a crime kind of a situation, doesn't use uh, or need not use face recognition as part of the collection. See, I would like to have cameras for traffic management, let us say. Now, that 
I don't have to see who is the person sitting inside the car as far as uh, I know that a car is uh, going in this. So basic uh, smart city software uh, need not necessarily be intrusive to uh, I mean, break the privacy of an individual. And when there is a certain incident for which let's say law enforcement has to monitor the movement, then that should be an exceptional situation where not the normal constable who is sitting behind the camera who is looking at this who should have that capability of looking at the face recognition combined with this document with this one or plate being read say that is a separate software so the processing has to be divided into two levels first level traffic management the traffic cop will not know who is there or which car is there he will just monitor the traffic okay Whereas if there is a police have asked you to track a particular car or something like that, then it is not the constable who should have the power to do it. There should be a higher level officer with greater responsibility. He will run that identification software in his machine that will identify the number plate. And then perhaps this uh, identifiable personal information is available only to that category of person who is authorized by law and who is required by law to know that. So if we understand that technology can segregate the information into these different levels, then some of the concerns which we have will not be there. But today, if technology people have one omnibus solution and it does everything, you, it takes the picture, it has the uh, face recognition ID so that you can just plug in another uh, this thing there then there is a uh, that is actually a technology implementation failure you can always for example when this traffic cop is looking at it I can even uh, obliterate the face itself when if I see a person I can uh, see a person walking from here to there but I don't have to see the face Okay, and my software itself can operate the face. If, can, if it can do face recognition, it can also do face obfuscation. Okay, so I would let uh, the uh, I mean, uh, software people develop that kind of multi layered software solutions. One meant for the uh, traffic cop, second meant for a law enforcement person, maybe a third one for NIA. Okay, I would give a lot more uh, I mean, resolution and other things for NIA, but I will not give the NIA kind of access to the traffic police or vice versa. Now, that has to be managed. That is, having created a system like that, it is quite possible that somebody will get the NIA person's password and uh, go to the database and try to take uh, the information. Those are aberrations which happen because of security failure. Okay, so implementation of any technology solutions is possible without uh, adversely affecting the privacy or security it requires some innovative thinking okay the pure technology people cannot do this because they don't see beyond the functionality okay only the techno legal people who understand technology and also understand the law they can tell the technology person it is a good functionality, but I don't want this functionality to be given to this person at this level. Okay, let me se separate this. Okay. So my question is when these all these smart cities, we are talking about capacity building of our municipal staff, because uh, most of these smart city people, some are private and some are from the existing system. So how do you propose to uh, improve their understanding and knowledge of this technology, technological system. Say so this uh, new uh, technology, as well as the new law, which is coming, uh, every person has to be aware. There is no doubt about that. And when PDP becomes the biggest uh, problem will be in the government segment, because private sector, at least people have some idea about uh, data protection, but government sector, they don't even know what is data protection. So a lot of awareness has to be built. But what I'm saying is technology control so that anonymized information should be made available to the larger part of the municipal staff because for their functionality, anonymized information is sufficient. For example, you're uh, talking about statistical department. They want to know how many births and how many deaths. They don't need to know the name of the person, parents and other things. They want 
perhaps uh, only a gender or something like that. So many people were born today, um, so many people died yeah, today. One, kind one, of one example of this is like uh, in America, they in, uh, introduced this technology of tracking people's movement from one place to another. And they tracked it for two years. And after that tracking, they realized that so, so many people are going from this location to that location. So they uh, they need housing in that particular area. Right. So housing policy based on big data, that was, uh, I think, for, first of its, its kind in, uh, that happened in uh, one of these cities in America. So this kind of anonymous data uh, can be shared with the municipal staff and uh, those people. Now, now I will uh, come to uh, the very important uh, subject that you are already working on this PDPA. Can you, can you explain this uh, bill and the act to our, to in the layman terms to our audience? What is this all about and how it is going to change this whole ecosystem? See, presently we were working under the regime of Information Technology Act, okay, which said that if data is misused, there will be a punishment. That is a cyber crime law. Okay, so if you hack into somebody's information, uh, you are liable under that. Now, what this uh, Information Technology Act had was that the intermediaries or the companies who are in possession of this personal information need to take certain precautions to ensure that hacking doesn't take place, ensure that uh, the compromise doesn't take place. Uh, this was the section 43 capital A of Information Technology Act. But unfortunately, Information Technology Act did not have adequate deterrence. There was no monitoring authority. So it was there in the law, but nobody was following it. So worldwide, after um, say particularly the GDPR, there was uh, a kind of a focus on personal data to be protected in a particular manner. So our Personal Data Protection Act has followed that global trend where we are introducing certain proactive measures to be taken up by the companies in order to reduce the risk of privacy loss. Okay, this was also necessary because the Puttaswamy judgment Supreme Court said that privacy is a fundamental right of uh, an Indian person and um, Privacy can be infringed if the information about a person, which we call as personal information, um, is not regulated. That is, basically, we want an individual to have the choice. Say, I have to decide how much of my personal information I give to you and how much I authorize you to use it, how much you can send it to your friends or something like that. So use and disclosure of personal information should be at the choice of the data subject. It is the principle of data protection, and that is also supposed to protect the privacy. Say so we are trying to protect the privacy through data protection. Okay, yes. so Indian Act also has adopted the same principle. So what it has said is before you collect any personal information, try to get the consent. Uh, ask him whether I can collect your information, and while asking, no. tell him what you are collecting how you want to use it. And after giving that information, tell him, please permit me to collect your information and use it in this particular manner. So it's a consent-based collection of personal information, which is the key to this Personal Data Protection Act. <coughs> Having collected it, if I don't uh, do what I have agreed to do in the consent uh, form, a certain rights are given to the data subjects saying that you can find out what I am doing, it's called right to access. You, if I have got a wrong information, you can ask me to correct it, right to correction. In the ultimate uh, situation, you can always tell me that uh, I want to stop the use of my personal information and you have to delete it. So certain rights are given to the data subject that after having allowed uh, the uh, collection of the information, I can check whether you are doing it properly or I want to change. So that is rights. One is the consent-based uh, processing, and second is the rights. Third most important thing is that the organizations have been told that without anybody asking you to do or not do, you have to follow a certain compliance measure. Now you have to protect the uh, information in a particular uh, manner. You have to appoint a, sec a separate person called data protection officer, and uh, you have to submit a a statement to the data protection authority who will be appointed, um, giving a plan of action of how you plan to 
um, process uh, the data, which is called privacy by design policy. So like in the case of public issues, now before you want to go for a public issue I, IPO, you have to submit a prospect test to the SEBI, is it not? That uh, SEBI will show to all the investors, please give money to this company, they want to use it in a particular manner. Indian Act has adopted a similar principle for collecting data. Before you collect personal data, please show the purpose of that through a privacy by design policy, which is registered with the Data Protection Authority. And in some cases, separate data protection impact assessment has to be done and shared it with the, share it with the DPA. So some precautions are initiated so that data is processed in a manner which is in the interest of the data uh, subject. We call this person as data principal and we call this processor as a data fiduciary. We actually hold him as a trustee of data uh, of the individual. And we also have a data breach notification so, aspects. Yeah. Mentioned about the CB and the IPO thing of the stock market. So uh, maybe uh, we can look forward to having some kind of a rating system for the organization. Those are collecting data. Like uh, all these uh, institutions, they, they give credit rating to companies and then investors decide that they, they want to invest. It is already in there. Say in, uh, PDPB <coughs> already has got something called DTS. Uh, system that is called data trust score. Okay, so every organization which is audited by a data auditor, which is mandatory once in a year, like your statutory financial audit, the auditor uh, has to provide what is called a DTS for the particular company. Now that is the credit rating. So just as a credit rating, this is the DTS actually rates a company as to its capability for protecting personal data. So, of course, that is what the auditor will interpret. If I am interpreting a particular company, I will say you have in implemented so many measures. And I think that you have to get this much of score. So, point you raised has oh. already been taken into account. That is an innovation which is in, there in Indian PDPB. It is not there in uh, GDPR. There are several things PDPB has got which is not there in GDPR. This is one such uh, thing. That's very nice. I think we are, everyone will be looking forward to this uh, Bill, I think recently also that uh, the issue of Amazon not uh, uh, com um, meeting the, this uh, joint parliamentary committee, Minakshi Lekhi has made that statement. Uh, I think there was some miscommunication as, as Amazon was saying. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, my question is that, uh, my, my last question to you, because we have talked about policy, we have talked about how this government system is going to handle data and what they can do to uh, make things better for citizens and data protection. My question is that uh, how users should behave online and what precaution they should take, because that is very important question. I, would, I think most of, of our people, those are watching us right now, they will be interested in knowing what precaution they should take. Say so law will state that any person, any company uh, taking your data should seek your permission. And that permission should be an informed consent. That is, he has to inform what, uh, in detail and then obtain the consent. Now, how practically it translates is that before you are in a situation where you are submitting the personal information, there will be a consent form which has to be given to you. Sometimes it comes in the form of a privacy policy. Okay, so when we are downloading an app, uh, people will ask, uh, I uh, will say display the privacy policy and you have to accept it or something like that. But the point many people miss is that when you accept a privacy policy of an organization, that contains permissions of how my uh, data is being used. In mobiles, we have got these permissions, okay? Permission to read an SMS, permission to take a photograph, something like that. So most of the time, the problem will be that an organization collecting the information collects more information than what is necessary for the particular service. That actually prohibits that. Now, at present, there was no monitoring authority. Tomorrow, if any company gives a uh, privacy policy saying that I'm collecting it for this particular purpose and gives a list of permissions required, which is in excess of the purpose for which it is required. Now, if this is brought to the notice of the DPA, Data Protection Authority, or by way of complaint or something like that, or the Data Protection Authority uh, out of its own, uh, say, audit system finds it out, they can penalize this organization heavily. So, okay, the fines can extend up to 4% of their turnover 
or up to 15 crores of rupees. So uh, at least law makes that provision. Now, how it will be implemented? Some people will have to complain. If they feel they have a problem, they have to complain. Law has also made another provision. Knowing that India has a problem where there are a lot of uneducated persons using it, they have provided for an authority, uh, say a service called consent manager. So some people may say, I will become a consent manager so that people can use my services. When they download apps, you don't know whether uh, the app really requires this permission or not, because you are not perhaps, let us say, well versed in uh, technology. So, but I am perhaps uh, capable of doing it. So there is a system called consent manager who will act as an intermediary between the data fiduciary who collects the information and this data principal who gives the information to bridge any gap of knowledge or expertise and also language issues. You say privacy policy is there in English and will, you, will it be acceptable to people in the rural areas? Obviously it will not be. Okay, there is no way that you can convey everything you want to do in the local dialects and other things. But this, again, that is why PDPB is an innovative method because consent manager is also not envisaged in GDPR and other things. It is specifically in the Indian context. So an individual who does not want to take the risk, instead of directly downloading the apps and other things, they can use the services of a consent manager who will be, when you want to download an app and the person asks name, address, et cetera, there should be a button which uh, di directs him to the consent manager and consent manager will provide the information. This is more like Aadhaar now has got this virtual Aadhaar ID. So the law provides for the consent manager creating a sort of a pseudonymous identity uh, in such a manner that privacy is protected but the purpose for which the information is required is also carried out. There is no legal infringement. And if the law enforcement wants to know who is the pseudonymous person, the intermediary can provide that. So there is a beautiful system which has been thought of in the PDPB uh, in the form of consent manager. I hope that will address most of the concerns which you have got. So individuals have to look for such consent managers and business people have to set up consent managers and tell people that means become my member. I will give you this special service. It is like in copyright, you have got copyright societies. No, uh, This is something similar uh, to that. I think that is what people should understand and use the services when it is available. Then some of the concerns will be addressed. Thank you so much, sir, for your uh, insight on data privacy and how this is going to change after that this PDPA is introduced. There are many provisions, as you told, that, 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 that will benefit uh, uh, online users in India. And I am very sure that users will also learn more about uh, the importance of their data and how they are going to share as the time passed by. But the major challenge still is that internet penetration is going up, but the awareness of uh, how to use internet should also go up. I think uh, that that start with with happen with the government uh, employees that, that the people those are going to manage the data of the people. They should also understand how to protect and they should also be accountable when this <clears throat> anything any leak or uh, happens. So thank you very much, sir, for giving your insight on this subject. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us uh, for this one-on-one -on -one interaction. We will meet you next week on the same time. Thank you so much till then. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.